And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning brother to the temple. One half... One half of... In... Oh... Of bed one one major part I should say uh, in order in order for me not to get the hierarchy confused of coming to a straight from Bedrock Games, al along with the along with the recently released Strange Tales of Songling, which we'll be getting into tonight, the one and only Brendan Davis. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight? Hello? Oh no! Oh, we're start we're starting we're starting off on the right foot. <laughs> that's okay. You know that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh can, can you hear me? Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Am I am I am I live? Y yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, what? Uh, I, I I I you cut out, so I don't know if you asked me a question or not. No, no. It's just it. We're ju we're just get we're just getting started on the on the front. Um. Apolo apologies for the shenanigans. There's been, there's some iffiness going on. Um, but with that with that said, now your now um last time I had you on along along with the along with the good the good doc, the good doctor of the tacos <laughs> Ryan Ryan was the guy yep. I brought on last time. Well, I I had you both on, um, but. That was to, that was on focusing on um, Ogre Gate, and for we kind of dipped into Strange Tales of Songling, but we didn't have enough time to really dive deep into it. So, I'd like to open with that. Okay. Where, first off, the idea of doing a RPG based on Chinese ghost stories. When did that really start coming about? Um. It really evolved over time. I think it started when I, when I was working on Ogregate, I was doing a lot of research on China and reading a lot of literature. And one of the books that I kept going back to was the Penguin edition of Strange Tales of the Chinese Studio from Pu Song Ling, which was uh, which is a condensed version of the book. And I became so obsessed with this book, I would use it when I was running Ogregate to come up with adventure ideas all the time. And it just was really useful for that. I, I discovered that it was one of the most useful tools in, in, on my shelf. And, and also, I just loved the stories. And so I ended up uh, doing a series of blog posts where I turned all of every story in the Penguin edition on the blog, like one to three of them a day, I think, uh, into gameable content. You know, I like made like NPCs or adventures, and I would just read a story and then post something about it on the blog. I did all of them. And then... And then I ended up getting so obsessed that I bought like, you know, all these different versions of, of Strange Tales from the Chinese studio. So I have like the um, Chinese Classics Editions, which is like a four volume set. I got another variation on it uh, in a, a couple of others, actually. And and I just was, you know, constantly reading this thing. Uh, it just it just clicked with me for some reason. And I liked movies like a Chinese ghost story and painted skin and all that stuff. And that all comes from Strange Tales from a Chinese studio. And so I knew I wanted to do something like that. And it started out as a concept called The Constables, which was just going to be a really contained adventure. I was thinking I was going to do like a 30-page supplement or something, and I was going to still have it be Ogregate. But then I decided I wanted to do something that was a little different than Ogregate. And so I took more of a Beckme type of approach to the system. And I simplified it. I really stripped it down. And I decided to go with having character paths because I wanted there to be like, I just wanted it to be a really quick point of entry. I wanted it to be more lethal than Ogre Gate. And I wanted the whole game to be focused on this concept. I didn't want to just attach it to Ogre Gate. So, so that's kind of how it started. I don't know if that answers the question fully or not. Now, obviously this, obviously um, Ogre Gate was, very much, very much in the realm of Wuxia and Tiansha, 
And this yep. one's more in the realm of um of go of ghost stories, spooks. Mm -hmm. Um The first question that I have on that is is more of a it's more of a lore based one, but Obviously, there's a lot of people who are doing um, who are doing horror who are doing horror based R who are doing and running horror based RPGs these days. Um, what are what would you say are some of the things within um, within Chinese ghost stories that would be familiar to them, and what would be some of the things that they may have to adjust to? I didn't I didn't catch one part of that question. Could you just repeat it really quick? Um, what would be some What would be some Somebody coming in from a very Western horror perspective, what would be some of the things that they might catch on to quickly for for this for Songling? What would be some of the things that might take a bit more adjusting? I mean, I think a lot of the stuff is similar. The monsters are a lot of them like you know folk folklore based monsters, mm -hmm. and you know even European legends and stuff vary tremendously from place to place and time to time. And in, and in gaming, we often codify them. You know what I mean? They often get very uh, uh, you know, the, the, we, we kind of end up with like one hag over time. Do you know what I mean? But like, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's all different variations. And I think a lot of the monsters are fairly familiar in that sense. Do you know what I mean? There's, you know, old evil women. There are ghosts. There are, um, you know, uh, you know, undead creatures that, you know, can can drain human life, that kind of thing. There, there, there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences. You know, some of them would be that a lot of the, ghosts and the monsters in these stories behave a lot like people and to the point that the protagonists in the stories often have romances with them um which isn't to say that they're all benevolent but they're and sometimes they're even not benevolent but they still have a romance but there is there's just more of a human interaction that goes on and the ghost world seems to have some kind of order and rule to it uh you know things like that and obviously some of the details are different like you know, like a, a hopping vampire is uh, not the same thing as like a, a Western concept of a vampire. They're, they're different. Mm -hmm. They're different concepts. They come from different things. But it seems like over time they kind of somehow met. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like it's, it's like there were these two different ideas. And, you know, by the time you get to like the later versions of Mr. Vampire, there's, you know, there is actually a lot of Western vampire being drawn into the lore. So it, you, you can... They will. There, there, there are similarities. There is some, you know, cross communication. I think between these things. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the ghosts are still kind of ghostly. Do you know what I mean? They're still. I, I think it's similar. You just kind of. I mean, I mean, I, I do what I can in the monster section to give people descriptions of individual monsters and hope that's enough. But I would, you know, say that the best thing you can probably do is, if your time is really limited and you want a good sense of how it's different watch the movie a chinese ghost story and if you if you have a little more time maybe watch a version of painted skin either like the, the king who version or the 2008 version or the um even painted skin resurrection um but really i would recommend getting a copy of strange tales from a chinese studio and just kind of leafing through and reading some of the stories they're really short some of them are only a page long some are barely a couple of paragraphs some of them are like you know longer like 10 pages 20 pages but uh they're, you know they're they're really good stories and it's the kind of thing where the way that i did it was i just tried to take each of these stories individually and emulate them as best i could that was that was my approach and so um you know and I, I think that uh i don't know I, I i don't think it's all that different to be honest i think it's just in the details that it's different you know and in the um and in some of the things i mentioned like how the ghost world does kind of seem to have a very human structure to it. The, you know, afterlife seems to have a very human structure to it. And, uh, you know, getting used to the lore would be another thing that's uh, obviously maybe a hurdle. Like, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a bad thing to pick up on a, you know, on an, you know, some kind of handbook to Chinese mythology. Do you know what I mean? That, that can be very useful or Chinese religion so that you just have an overview of some of the basic things. Um, but I honestly, this book, the way that I wrote it, I intended it to be fairly easy. It's not, it's not, it's not as much like Ogregate. Ogregate was more like you kind of had to understand the genre to really play in it and run it. And this is different. This is sort of like, 
you can take it and you can run with it and you know you don't really have to worry about getting all the details right like like a, like some of them are baked into the mechanics and into the monsters but uh you know it, it, you know you just just you know you just play the game and you know as time goes on you the familiarity can come to you as you encounter more of the of the source material um sorry does that answer the question or is that yeah I'd, me just I'd rambling I'd say I'd say so man okay um, you can cut me off if I'm rambling because I do tend to ramble um takes one to know one in that regard <laughs> so you had mentioned um taking a Beck me like approach now obviously this is st this is still be this is still based um can you um, hear me yeah I can hear you um this is this still is rooted within the the uh, network system that you use for um, the majority of the stuff coming out of Bedrock. Yeah. And, but you, you since you mentioned taking a Beck me twist and um and the whole thing with paths, mm -hmm. I'm curious what th what things from the network system in Ogre Gate were easier or more or more difficult to um to take out as you were developing it. I don't think anything, nothing was that tough to take out because a lot of it was just, I don't really need a rule for this. This is bogging down the game. Do you know what I mean? There were residual mechanics in there that we didn't need. And I kind of started from the ground up. I was like, I'm basically rewriting network from a simpler point of view. And I'm keeping it as simple as possible. If it, if it doesn't add anything to the game, it's not going in. The hardest part was honestly figuring out how to do the skill point allotments for the... Um, for the character paths. That was the tough one because I had a way I had to simplify it, but then I had to be able to express that simplification in English to people. And that was not easy. Um, so that was the hardest part. Now that's, that's something I could definitely see, especially since, especially since there's the fact that network, obviously if you're shooting for Beck me Beck me like all of like all of D and D is never has never been designed for a skill system and yes I'm also Hello? include oh hang on sorry about that the the ping's been acting up there's probably gonna be a storm tonight um give me one second here folks Any hey, there we go. Oh, so um, did, did did you get my answer? Or did it cut out? No, I, I got I got your I got your answer. Um, now when it come now, what I what I was going to what I was going to say is that I could easily see there being some trickiness due to the fact that taking a Beck me like approach it is taking a is taking an approach with a game that doesn't really have a skill system and. And has never been comfortable yeah. with one. And yes, I'm including even modern D and D not being comfortable with skill systems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but was the given the fact that the paths that you have that you have have um have an initial allotment with um with skill with um skills was it more, was the difficult part more of figuring out what sort of allotment that you're going to give the um, skills in order to make sure that need, that there wasn't a definitive skill monkey path? Well, there was that, but it was honest. Honestly, the hardest part was just I had this way of doing it, and it was just hard to describe. And it took us a little while to figure out how it could actually be set on the page. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was it. Was just the expression of it more than anything else. And um, and like you said, like obviously, I, I should be clear to people: this is not intended as like a a full Beck me style system. It's 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 you know it's not D and D in any sense of the word. Um, I just was taking my inspiration from Beck me. I had played in my friend Adam, who uh, Adam Boulderstone was the editor of this book, and I had, I was in his campaign of uh, where he ran Beck me. Uh, you know, around the time that I was conceiving this this game. And I remember really liking the, like, you know, sometimes you go back to an old book like that and, and you're like, I really love the way this looks. I love the simplicity of it. I love how it approaches weapons. I love how, and so all the things I loved, I knew I wanted to kind of emulate its approach to those things. And so that's kind of what I took from it. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh but yeah in terms of the the skills I, I it was honestly just the expression that was the hardest part we uh um i think we knew enough about the game to kind of avoid uh a lot of any any concerns about brokenness and stuff like that we had plenty of time to play test the paths that we we really hammered out you know getting them as balanced as we could so um you know the the, the problems were mainly in just how to express that aspect of character creation yeah um was it particularly easy or difficult to integrate um the kung fu techniques from ogre gate into this uh well i didn't really integrate them what i did was i created uh, a set of abilities that the wandering sword has and i think a couple of them might be similar to certain ogre gate abilities mm -hmm. but they're basically they're they're pretty nerfed compared to ogre. like uh, an ogre gate ability gives you quite a bit of firepower and these are pretty light these are not massively powerful abilities and there's not that many of them in the book either so the idea is you pick the path and you have you know a selection of abilities but it's not massive i i kind of wanted the opposite of what happened with ogre gate where ogre gate was this massive tome of abilities i really wanted you know things to be pared down a lot more in this game mm -hmm. and that's the that's the other thing i i know because like the kung fu techniques that's ba that's ba you basically only have um two pages worth of that yeah yeah though of course yeah. I, I do appreciate that it's still tied to um skills yeah, and the thing about it is, I mean, this is not a wuxia game. Like, there are wuxia elements because a lot of the movies have those kind of characters. Even some of the stories have like these martial heroes in them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but the, um, but the movies, especially like again, a Chinese ghost story is you know very. You know, there's more than one version of the story. There's like three. It, it's a trilogy actually, and there's other movies that are similar to that. But in in a Chinese ghost story, there's there's a lot of these kind of wuxia looking elements and so i wanted those to be present i just didn't want them to um i didn't want them to take it out of the horror realm and out of the ghost story realm so it's there um and sometimes sometimes it's useful to be a swordsman in this game but there are times when it's not it, it, you know it can be it can be it can be a limitation too on you yeah and as it, as evidenced by the fact that at, at a high level the um the ritual master path um, starts to lo starts to lose his ability to take damage compared to others. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, that thing that was a feature of the game. I wanted that to appear at a much lower level originally, um, but I, I I received far too much negative feedback when I try. I, it was originally like level five or six. I forget where it was. It was it was basically wherever the um, the wandering sword gets their boost, the the ritual master was going to get the lower. Uh, the, the lowering of their max wounds. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people were not happy with that. So I, I relented, even though it really upset my sense of symmetry to the game. Uh, on one hand, I can see where you're, where you're coming from on that. On the other hand, um, it's, it's always, it's always tricky to talk somebody into playing a character that's going to be, um, significantly more frail. Especially yes, when yes. they're going to be in the um, thick of it in one form or another. I I think that the people that were giving me feedback on that were right. And that's why I ended up siding with it. Because sometimes you realize, I really want this. But it's just not flying with people. Do you know what I mean? Or they're making a very good case for why it should be this way. And so mm -hmm. um, it was better for the game to have it not be that way. But it's still it's still one of those things where, you know, if if it were just me... You know, and I was only worried about my sense of what works. I, I would have liked it to have been there, just just for the symmetry. But maybe that's you know, <laughs> me being a little too pedantic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, when it when it um when it came to when it came to the uh, skill when it came to the skill setup, you did you did mention um. You meant you mentioned get you mentioned um, skim, skimming that down a bit and how that was a bit tricky. Um, yeah, was it was it mostly in the sense of of making sure that there that when you when skimming it down there wasn't one skill that was getting too much use or were there other um, hurdles? I mean, m most of the hurdles were really um, so in terms of the skills themselves and getting that list to where it was. 
it's not it's not that much smaller than ogre gate but each of the entries is shorter you know we, we didn't we didn't have these expansive entries on them and we also took away things like the open skills because those really add a lot of mechanical drag to the game and we didn't want that so we just wanted these skills to be these light things that are not intrusive and just help you flesh out who you are but you don't have to get too terribly specific with them um i think overall i mean some of the skills there's always going to be a skill that is important over others you got, you know speed is this unavoidable skill in the game because it affects initiative mm -hmm. muscle is this unavoidable skill because it affects damage do you know what i mean there there yeah. are there are these skills that matter more than others if you're worried about combat and uh you know but i've just sort of learned to you know, you know number one accept that but number two you know eventually you need people that can do these other things so you can't you you know even if there are these you know occasional skills that are uh important for very specific reasons of the game you know that you you still are going to need people that that'll have the ritual skill or have um you know uh some kind of mental or social skill or knowledge skill for for you know especially for a game like this so it, te it tended to work out in the end because in this isn't the type of game where it's always about the fighting. Sometimes it's about the planning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, you know, overall, I wasn't too worried about that with the skills. And also, I had had enough time to... I'm so familiar with Ogre Gate. We've had so much time to play test it and all that stuff that the, the skills... The, all the changes to skills were ones I kind of had had in my head already. Do you know what I mean? I kind of knew these are things that I... These are changes that I'm, you know... Uh, happy to make to this system and i know that it's going to work and it, it, it did so yeah now when it comes to when it came to um when it came to paths now mm -hmm. obviously w obviously within this system we have we have um we have four um, paths that um I think for, I think for people who are inundated with old school play are these paths are going to be familiar with to them um you you cut out at the beginning of that, um, so I didn't. Uh... When it comes to when it comes to paths, um, mm -hmm. now obviously the four paths that we have are going to be fam are I'd say are going to be familiar to people who, with um, a background with old school play. Yeah. But yeah, one of agree. the main things that I'm cur that I'm curious about is why go why did you go with a ten level cap? Um, because we wanted this to be a one shot game. And we wanted it to be one of the problems I ran into. So when I made Ogre Gate originally, that was only supposed to go up to Chi rank six. That was my original plan. And if you actually play that game and play it all the way through, you'll see that up through Chi rank six, the game works great. And 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 like a lot of games, it starts to break down more as you get past that high high level, up into like you know Chi rank seven, eight, and nine, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted something a lot more manageable. I, I didn't, and also I didn't, I, 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 I didn't, I just didn't want, I, I didn't want the brokenness of higher levels. Um, and there was this concept in the game that this might possibly be the afterlife and there's the 10 court of hells. And so if you're advancing once per adventure, each adventure could conceivably be one of the levels of hell. And I kind of like that. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't remember all of the discussions around it. But ultimately, 10 is what worked. And then, you know, the idea is you retire your character at that point, and then you could make new ones if you want to, and they could be the next generation or whatever. But this is really more... This is the kind of game where I didn't imagine people necessarily using it for their core campaign. I imagined them using it the way that people often use a game like Cthulhu, where, you know, you, you, you play it in between your more regular campaigns. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, it's sort of the... Uh, you know, I, I imagine you know, people playing anywhere from like, you know, three to 10 sessions of it. So 10 seemed good for that reason too. Yeah. And when it, when did, it, did I cut out? Mm, hang on. Hello. Okay. There we go. Oh, Sorry. Did did you get all my answer? Or did I get cut yeah, out there? Yeah, yeah, you got. Yeah, I got all of it. Um, oh, okay. Now one of the now um. Now one 
per one um motif in per one motif in um particular that I could s that I could see s that I could see some um some kind some kind of getting used to is and this is some this is something that I po that I pointed out when I covered Ogre Gate that some people might need some getting used to is the fact that for a lot of people they've kind of been um conditioned to be to um be used to the attribute skill dynamic. Yeah. And yep. I think even even with even with this and I'd say I'd say doubly so they'd have to get used to the fact that there are no attributes in this regard. We're, you're just dealing with um skills and other skills. Um when play when playtesting both, did you ever have any issue? Did you ever have any case where somebody was looking at like where the attribute is, or was it pretty straightforward? Hang on. Um, what I was saying is that with a lot of pe a lot of people are um, conditioned to ha to see an attribute plus skill formula. Um, when running Ogre Gate or, run or running Songling, were there ever and doing and doing play tests of it, were there ever any instances where somebody um, had to take a bit of time getting used to that fact? I I didn't encounter that myself. Um, I I I I think that. Uh, that is an issue I've encountered with people occasionally with the network system, but it has it hasn't happened that much. It it's just something that I explain to them, you know, if if they ask about it. Uh, and and technically, even though there aren't attributes, there kind of are because muscle is still in there, speed is still in there. You know, there are things that are attribute like, but they're skills. Yeah. Um, and they do have some of the effects you might expect an attribute to have. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, so those things are still kind of present. It's just that when we made the system, Bill was very adamant that he didn't want attributes in the game. He wanted to have no attributes, and I, I, I understood what the reason for that, and I think I think that it uh, benefits the system, especially with a skill system. I just don't think that um, you had said that you know D and D's always kind of been awkward with the skill system or unhappy with it, or I forget your exact language. Um, but I think so whenever, whenever that's Dean... part of the thing is that mm -hmm. uh, when you have skills, adding attributes on top of the skills is a little bit much. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just having skills made sense for us. You know, yeah. the... um, and it's not, it's not like now it's not like it's the, it's not, it's not like it's the first instance of it, but it is, there 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 is a case where that where um i think a lot of people assume that f that formula even if yeah you have attributes that are as skills in this case yeah yeah um, well because i mean attributes are found in all kinds of games not just like D and D and stuff so i yeah. mean people really do expect it yeah i'd 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 say the the other ma the other major instance i can think of that goes pure skill pure skill based like that although it doesn't do it the same way you did would be um amp um, from Third Eye Games. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with that system. Um, it does. It does have. Instead of doing attribute and, and skill in that formula, a lot of times it'll have um, a combination of two different skills. And of of course, that is um, a gross <laughs> simplification, but. Hello?
All right, the um. Now, now, the other, th the something, something else I did, I did um. I did want I did want to no, I did want to uh, notice is when it come when it comes I'd say the um of the pa of the powers when it comes to the uh, pads the only the only ones that I'd that I'd say are a little bit more elaborate than than the rest would be rituals and was that to reinforce that um that if somebody's coming into this from like Beck me, that you're not going to be doing the old fire and forget with magic. I, I missed I missed the farce part of that. Um, when it comes rich, there's an there's an interesting difference between magic powers and um rit and rituals within oh, the setup. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm get I'm guessing part of that is to reflect the is to reflect the fact that. When it comes to how magic works in these in these kind of settings, it is not what um, a lot of people are ex would typically expect. In the in the sense that um, you'd pro this is probably leaning more to even with the go even with the um, ghost aspects, this is leaning more towards low low or folk magic than what than um, the kind of magic that they would be expecting. There we go. Oh. Oh. Um. When it would you say? I know I've fo I know I've um. I know I've focused on a lot of um the adjust the adjustment approach when it comes to the difference between so between songling and this, or not song um the difference between people's traditional approaches with fantasy and the like, but. Would you would you say that um, a lot of the supernatural el elements within something like Songling leans leans more into low fantasy? Yeah, I mean the the magical stuff all basically comes out of you know like Chinese ghost stories, strange tales from the Chinese studio, um, you know other other types of things like that. It's it's um you know some of it was all, there's also a series of movies about like black magic uh like uh like the film black magic and black magic 2 or uh boxer's omen those kind of films uh, um encounters of a spooky kind i i tried to bring in some of that that sort of stuff too and so it was just all it was basically taken from those kinds of movies those kinds of stories and i i think low magic is right but this is also a kind of because it's low magic i don't know it's almost sometimes more powerful uh it's it's not it's not high fantasy for sure. That wasn't that wasn't the uh, the aim. Uh, it's more the kind of magic where, in the hands of a clever player, it can do a lot. Yeah, and in that in that regard, when when somebody's when somebody's jumping into this kind of thing, and let's say let's say, give, given given the popularity of certain films, let's let's suppose, for instance that instead of instead of setting it in um the version of of historical china that you have in the book they set it a bit more contemporary um mm -hmm. what would what would be what would be some of the things that um what would be some what would be some of the kind kind of bullet points that would be advised to highlight in order to keep it te in order to keep that campaign having the feel of what you're going with with songling Um, what I was at, sorry, sorry about that bit, sorry about that bit of cutoff. What I was asking is, 
when it come if this was if someone was setting this into more contemporary things, what would be so, what would be some of the major um, po points that you'd re that you'd recommend emphasizing or de or de-emphasizing as it were when it comes to maintaining the feel of it being a songling campaign? So if it were like it's still China, but it's modern type of setting or it's in a different region of the world type of setting yeah different region of the world and part of the reason i part of the reason that kind of thing comes to mind is because of the uh, jang shi game that came out recently for your oh dealing. that yeah mm -hmm. yeah um i mean i don't i wouldn't necessarily recommend changing anything i think uh in terms of the the monsters and the mechanics obviously some of the uh, class abilities would have to be adjusted you might have to fix the paths mm -hmm. because you know, it's a little hard to explain why you're getting a Vila as a scholar character when it's as well past, you know, that system is no longer in use. So um, that stuff might have to change. Um, but but I have to think about it because that's, that's a complicated question. Um, yeah. I do think, though, that, you know, there are a lot of movies that are set in, um, in, the, in the, a more modern period, like The Witch from Nepal and um, and again, a lot of the uh, the Mr. Vampire movies and stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, Boxer's Omen, um, Black Magic. Uh, you could you could still set it in a modern day, but you definitely would have to have more modern. The, the trick would be the, the the player characters would need to be more modern mm -hmm. um, for it to work. And obviously, I might have to update the equipment list too. Yeah. Um, but I I haven't really you know it's funny I used to we started by making modern games. That's what we used to do. Terror Network, Crime Network, Horror Show, those were all modern games. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't really thought about doing modern for a while. So it's, uh, but I mean, I think, I think in this one, you know, you know, you, you, you would probably be able to retain some of the monsters, but you'd have to take another approach with the, uh, with the characters. You could probably get away with keeping the demon hunter. You could probably get away with keeping the wandering sword to an extent and the ritual master, I think the really difficult one is the scholar character, because um, those are so specific to something that just isn't really in place anymore. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Now, obviously, I'm not I'm not expecting that something like that to happen anytime anytime soon. It's just it's just one of those things because what I'm the thing that the thing that I'm the thing that I'm really looking into is because with a lot of with a lot of horror, there are always going to be certain aspects that are um, emphasized with different co with different types of cultural horror, and I'd say from what you've told me, I'd say one of the major ones with with um, something like Songli is to think of it less in the horror sense and more in the um, more in the f for I I know this might sound a bit odd, but fairy tale um, approach. And especially I th when I when I mean fairy tale, I'm especially referring to the the kind of the kind of fairy tale equivalent that you'd see in Eastern Europe. I'd say I'd say it would be a very good analog. Well, I I might say that, but I would also say those fairy tales are really great fodder for horror. So I don't know that you have to think of it less as horror. It's just that um, it's drawn from folklore. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But a lot of these, a lot of the folklore has evolved. Like the, you know, the the hopping vampire thing is is, is become a, you know, very, it's become a very specific thing over time. Do you know what I mean? A lot of like in in the strange tales from a Chinese studio, a lot of the early versions of that, and there's another writer Yuan Mei. A lot of the earlier versions of those creatures are simpler. Do you know what I mean? They're not, um, it, they don't quite have the look that they've developed. You know. To, to uh, that we recognize now so um but yeah i don't know i mean my feeling is uh, chi like uh, chinese horror movies are pretty scary i think so i'd be reluctant to recast this as i, I mean i get what you're saying because it is drawn from fairy tales mm -hmm. but i'm also thinking of movies like killer snakes and black magic which were also referenced in in the um uh in the dungeon master section of this or the game master section. And, and those, those are pretty horrifying movies. So I, I just think that it's, um, it's just that it's sort of like, you know, the, in any horror movie, the, the legends have to come from somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the, and so 
these the, the you know these are coming from you know a, a, you know anomaly accounts and folklore and and so and I think that I think the difference with Strange Tales from the Chinese studio is it's not all horror. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the difference. When it is horror, I think it is particularly scary. I know it's taken me a while to kind of get to this point, but I'm sort of thinking as I'm talking. So I think I think that it's it's more. But there's a lot of stories in there that are kind of funny or kind of you know just really weird things that happened. And so it doesn't all have to be pure horror. Um, you you can have you know just kind of strange, unusual things happening as well. Uh, but but I do think when it gets scary, it gets quite scary. I think like you know when you think of like a creature, we call them painted maidens in this one. Mm-hmm. But the story Hua Pi painted skin. That's a really horrifying story, and you know the the versions of it that have been on screen have been pretty scary. So, um, you know, it's very classic horror when it's presented on screen. Um, so I think I think you know I do tend to run it a little more from a horror angle for sure. Yeah. But you know there there are, there you know there are these other elements because it's taken from folklore. Mm-hmm. Um. Now one thing, one thing that I was a bit, that was a bit curious at, as to why you, why you mentioned this in the, um, in the essential viewing, um, part, mm-hmm. part of the book. Was Let me open re- that part up so I have it in front of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> was in was in regard to um, paint was in regard to painted skin. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You admit you had mentioned in that that you prefer the 2012 sequel to the original. Um, without go without going into anything spoilery, could you tell could you tell me why? I, I it's just personal preference. Um, they're both really good movies, and and I think that honestly, Painted Skin, the two thousand eight version, is is definitely more scary. I just feel that Painted Skin Resurrection does something very interesting. It's it's a very unexpected turn for the story, and. And it, I don't know, it has more emotional weight, I think. Um, and it, and then visually, I really like the way it looks. Do you know what I mean? I love, I love how painted skin resurrection looks. It just has this great, like the, the, the bear sequence is phenomenal. Um, the whole movie is shot really well. And the first movie shot well too, but it's got moments that are a little bit iffy. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, the first movie definitely follows the source material more. And the second movie, kind of goes in a different direction. Do you know what I mean? So they, they are different. Um, but I think I think what I like about Painted Skin Resurrection is where they take the the character, the, the monster in the movie it has a lot of um uh I guess you would I get you know I, I don't want to sound too pretentious, but like there's a lot, a lot of pathos to it. Do you know what I mean? It just it just there's this one scene where she rebukes uh an, another demon that's sort of like I don't think it's like her literal sister, but she calls her sister in it. And she rebukes her for not really understanding what loves mean. And the way she does it, I thought was number one, it's a really great actress in the role, but number two, the it's built on what happens in the first movie. So I just, I, 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 I really like what they do with that character. Um, and I just think it's one of these sequels where the sequel to me is kind of better than the original. And that's, you know, that's not, that's not typically the case. So, Oh, uh, in fact, in fact, it's it's rare it's rare enough with movies as it is, and it's even rarer when it comes to when it comes to horror because horror is, in my not so humble opinion, the hardest thing to make a sequel of. Yeah, it can, it can definitely be difficult. Um, though I will say, Chi- uh, a lot of people really like Chinese Ghost Story three. I, I like part one; that's my favorite. But I know a lot of people who prefer part three. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I think uh, there's a strong case to be made. I, I mentioned Black Magic and Black Magic Two. Uh, I think there's a strong case to be made for Black Magic Two. Um, so you know, it's also I don't know. I, one of my one of my senses with uh, a lot of the sequels I've seen uh, from movies like this is they don't often suffer from that problem of the sequel that you know is worse than the. Uh, than the original, um, and I don't know why that is. Actually, maybe it's just the ones that I've seen, but I I haven't encountered that quite as much as I did with say the Highlander series, or uh, you know, <laughs> you know, any any you know given uh, series that has a terrible sequel. 
Let's see, here I am having a good time, and then you have to remind me about Highlander 2 and piss me off. <laughs> yeah, well, it, Highlander 2 is the, the one... That's the sequel that that in, was the first bad sequel I really remember getting angry about when I was young. So, because I, I, I was convinced Highlander 2 was going to be outstanding when I went to go see it. I couldn't imagine. I, couldn't ima I was looking forward to it. I remember all the advertisements. I, I, I loved Highlander 1. And I was like, this is going to be amazing. How, you know, it's, it's the Highlander. It's going to be great. And and right from the beginning, they ruin it by retconning the uh, the lore. And then and then it just goes downhill from there. So um, uh, Please tell me you didn't suffer through the movies afterwards. <laughs> no, I, I, I refused to watch part three. I didn't see it till years later. Um, I was really... The thing that I didn't like about part three is in the final battle when the... Um, the sword fight. I think they were playing Dr. Feelgood, the Motley Crue song. I could be wrong, but I think that's the song they were playing. And the swords are clashing to the beat. And that really bothered me. That that <laughs> kind of took me out of the film. Look, um, I, I know I know that the first but, uh, movie had a director who um up until that point had only done music videos, but still <laughs> you uh, there I have a line. <laughs> and when you end up have when you end up having a climactic scene and disguise it as effectively a music video, mm -hmm. that line is crossed. I mean the the first movie I loved the first movie I thought did a great job. Yeah. Um, I mean, and the music in that they had they, you know had a, a more robust Queen soundtrack to it, and um, you know the it was just I don't know it was kind of like an unexpected kind of film. I remember when I first saw it, I saw it on video after it came out. So I saw it like in the year it came out, but on video Yeah. and it just, it just had, it just had me from the beginning. Um, but, but boy, did that sequel suck? Uh, yeah. Um, that's one of the, that's one of those things where I feel like one of these days I'm going to have to do a deep dive investigation as to why, because I, um, I'm no stranger to bad. I'm no stranger to bad works, and I'm definitely no stranger to bad sequels. But mm -hmm. sometimes there are those infamous ones where the story behind the scenes ha has more drama than what's on camera. That's um, true. That's true. Like my ultimate example of the of behind the scene of behind the scenes drama in that in that regard is um, is stuff like Heaven's Gate. Which is or or Apocalypse Now, both of which have had full on documentaries about how much making yeah. those particular yeah, movies were shit shows. Apocalypse Now is pretty famous for that at this point. Um, but uh, I don't know Highlander Two. I I just I think that the chief thing that really wrecked it was um, was changing the whole like like once you make them like an alien race like they did, that really undermines the whole story and then. And then it was just nothing good beyond that. Like everything that followed was just terrible. So uh, I, I have, you know, I, I don't even know if I want the explanation. I just know that it was a horrible sequel. Uh, yeah. Um, but you don't get that with a lot. Like, again, the Mr. Vampire series, a lot of the sequels to that are great. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of these, I think the sequels end up being perfectly good. So um, uh, I, I have to the th the thing that always ends up wrecking um horror sequels is the fact is the fact that people have too much knowledge i i guess i'd say yeah um, do you is has in your experience has that ever has ever undermined it when it comes when it comes to series like that or has that not really been a factor um i mean i don't i don't know that's a that's an interesting you mean like the I think with Painted Skin, the knowledge of what came before and the way that they handled it in Painted Skin Resurrection was was useful. Mm -hmm. um, it added to the story because you're not you're you're kind of no longer discovering the nature of this character. Do you know what I mean there's a different different things are sort of what keep you in suspense? Um, the the Mister Vampire movies are a little bit different from one to the next. Do you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're 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 able, and also those are comedies to an extent. Yeah, so, so there's, there's you can that. get away with more stuff when you're yeah when you're a comedy. Yeah, um, but the Black Magic series, I feel like that was it, it was kind of a new story, so it didn't it didn't um, you know I mean it 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 didn't really uh, it 
I thought that the Black Magic Two was quite scary, and I don't, I don't, I, I, I think knowledge of the first one only made that one more scary. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it really depends on the movie. I think, I think if it's a series where, like, you know, we have a lot of movies that are like feature the same monster from one to the next, and the monster is the antagonist, and that's you know, in 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 some of these, the difference I suppose is like in the Painted Skin movies. You know, it's not like it, it, the, the the there is a monster, but she's not this creature that's like lurking in the shadows that you never see. She's a character that you get to know, just like all the other characters. So, um, I think that might also be why it's not bogged down with some of those issues. I I don't know. It's not that's not a question I've given a lot of thought to, to be honest. So, um, um, it's definitely know, I'm not one, sure. It's, it's one that I um, it's one that I'm always thinking about because, um, I find I find that run I find that running. Even even with all the scary story incidents that I've had around around campfire since I was a little kid, um, doing sk- doing horror role playing is one that I've always found fraught with minefields, um, especially since everybody at my table grew up on grew up in the holy church of mystery science theater, <laughs> which um, which makes the serious parts a little bit harder to do in my case. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, I was saying that I was saying that um, I think I think that a I think that outright horror themed um, RP role playing um, has some more pitfalls than you'd see in other uh, genres. Um, especially since the GM has to surprise players who may know who may know a little too much about how um, certain monsters or certain motifs with horror work. Or in my case, I have a bunch of riffers on my on my on my table, so it's a, so it's a little bit it's it can be a little bit trickier. It's not impossible; it's just tricky. And hang on a second. I was just I was just saying that it's some. Um, when oh okay, okay. yeah oh, I'm when, sorry go ahead when it com- when it comes to when it comes to running horror versus versus other games have you have there been any moments where where um you've had some pit where you've had some pitfalls when it comes to that genre compared to others or has it been run the has it been run the same way you'd run another genre of of um storytelling. Um, well, I mean, I've been running horror since I started because the first game that I really DM'd was Ravenloft, and I GM that pretty much constantly through the '90s and even through the early 2000s. And most of the games that I ran tended to to be horror. Um, I played a lot of horrorish campaigns in Torg. I played a lot of you know different types of horror games like Cthulhu. And and my approach to horror has become increasingly real, real relaxed over the years where I don't worry so much about this has got to be horror. This has got to be scary all the time. I, you know, I, I, I think, I think I often succeed in getting those things, but it's, it's not really, I'm not bothered if it becomes a more comedic session or if it's a more of a beer and pretzels night. I, I don't, I don't worry about that too much. Cause I feel like, these things kind of come in waves and they ebb and flow. And sometimes the scariness is going to creep in and sometimes the atmosphere will be there and sometimes it won't. And you just kind of work with whatever the, you know, whatever is kind of going on with the table that night, you know? And, and sometimes that's built on what came before. If you had a super scary session a week ago that everybody was, you know, like, you know, still talking about, you're probably not going to top that. So you don't worry about topping it that week. You just worry about, you know, doing something fun and interesting that day. Um, I don't run it the same way I rather run other types of games because I'm all when I'm when I run horror, I'm always looking for the horror. Do you know what I mean? I'm always looking for the thing that is going to, you know, kind of get them. And I'm also uh, looking for, you know, I, I I don't do the thing where I read this long, you know, description of things or I speak in a way that sounds like I'm talking from a book, but I am more careful and selective in my description so you know i i will describe things in a way that is you know gonna help put them into the 
points of view that they're experiencing or uh you know going to hint at suggested things uh that are that are happening but maybe not give them all the details because it's not like they have a full mental picture or everything there might be a you know like a werewolf in the corner somewhere lurking around and they you know they don't they only you know they smell its breath or they you know there's some some clue to it but not the whole picture uh so i'm careful in what details i provide but i don't worry about those details sounding like shakespeare or something or lovecraft <laughs> or you know it, i try to speak in my ordinary voice when i'm running these things mm -hmm. um and uh and just be kind of relaxed I, I i think i take an approach there's a saying in in uh, martial arts and boxing like a relaxed fighter will often you know beat the non-relaxed fighter and i take the same approach to gming which is i think the relaxed gm is you when you're when you're gming that uh, well let me say when i'm a gm the times that I have the most difficulty is when I tighten up, when I get, you know, when I really get concerned about doing a good job and I start to second guess myself. Um, when I'm relaxed, that's when I, you know, get into the zone that I need to be in to GM. So that's how I, I definitely try to keep that uh, when I'm doing horror too. All right, I can, I can def, I can definitely uh, get that. And plus, I'd imagine doing this. Can I get. I guess the. I guess the key takeaway in that is that horror is ninety percent atmosphere. Like. I went. Yeah. I, I mean. I think. I think. I think atmosphere is a big, big part of it for mm -hmm. sure. Um, like I think. I think the. Um, is I. Th I think would make. I think the. In the case of video games, what makes them scary is the. It, when it comes to doing horror, is. You're in a place that, you, by all accounts, you don't want to be in. <coughs> um, and with... I think, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. Okay. So, I can hear you so far. Um, okay. Let me make. Let me knock on wood to make sure I don't jinx it. There we go. Um. When it comes now, when it comes to you mentioned you mentioned wanting to have wanting to have a um, I think you mentioned a, b a bit more of a brutal or more lethal lethal combat, and I can I've yeah. always seen that to an extent with the network system, mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that you've got, that um you've got fairly you've got fairly you've got lo you've you don't exact. You don't exactly have a whole lot of health, even for even for the tank year of of classes. Yeah. Um, were there? How frequent were um, TPKs when you were testing Songling? Oh, they happened. They happened for sure. Um, one of my first play tests when I when I like no the the second play test of Heads of Waterfall Bay was a total party kill. Um, you, you know that happened. That's what I wanted to happen. I, I I mean not not that I was trying to do a total party kill, but I was expecting that total party kills would occur. Um, and and the thinking that I had with it was, you know, uh, you know, I grew up in the period where we were told don't kill the players for horror. Like horror is about suspense and building dread and all these things. And I used to live that, you know, religiously. I, I you know I would I would I I, I use that rule. I, I thought I thought it was useful, but. The longer I did this, the more I realized, you know, character deaths really, number one, you kind of have to keep it on the table fairly. It's got to be there. And I think that when characters have too much plot armor or too much just hit points or health or wounds in general, uh, it's harder to scare them than if, you know, because in a horror movie, characters die by getting stabbed. Do you know what I mean? They die from things that heroes in a lot of fantasy rpgs don't die from and heroes from my ogre gate game would not die from um i wanted characters that would die the way that you would die in a movie that is you know set in this kind of universe and so you know a lot of you know not all the characters but a lot of them are these sort of scholarly types that really don't have that many defenses and even the heroes that you know have swords can still get the life sucked out of them by a ghost so mm -hmm. I, I wanted it to play that way. And I, I think that, um, uh, I think that, you know, that was another reason why we kind of focused on the type of character creation we did. We timed character creation because we wanted people to bring in characters quickly if they did die. Um, 
you know, I don't care if people are just, you know, bringing in new characters rapidly. The point isn't to remove people from the game, but I did want, you know, character death to be a real thing. Um, and also there is a, you know, and, and it's not inconsequential when you die, you come, if, if you make a new character, your new character is lower level. Um, and uh, we do have a gentle death option so that it's not quite as low, lower level as it is in the, by the book option. But, um, but I like having consequence for a character death too, so that you're concerned about it happening. Um, and yeah, that just seemed to work. I mean, I, uh, I, you know, that was one. Of, this was definitely, a, you know, when we play tested this game, the, the character lethality seemed to be exactly where I wanted it to be. It really, it really worked out well. I thought. Yeah, I can, I can, def I can definitely, um, I can definitely see that. And <coughs> uh, at the very least, you were, you were, you were relatively kind because I don't see a. Um, I don't see a Songling version of Tomb of Horrors anywhere, so I'll count that as a plus. <laughs> well, there is a... Uh, this is spoilery, so if you're going to be a player, don't listen to me. But in one of the adventures, there is a ghost that'll just rip out your eyes. Um, you know, I won't say where the ghost is, but it's in a location that you might want to peer into. Um, and and so things like that are in there. But yeah, it's not it's not quite Tomb of Horrors. But, uh, but there are... I mean, th it's built there. There are four adventures in the book and the adventures can be quite brutal. They were, you know, that's why we had a total party kill in, uh, in, in the ads of waterfall Bay and the other ones we, you know, we definitely had characters that did not survive them. Um, and you know, it, it's, uh, but yeah, it's not, it's, it, this isn't a game that's sort of a, you could do a dungeon crawl with this game with some modification. Um, but it's not intended for dungeon crawls. I mean, it is. It, it does have exploratory elements. You know, the, the first adventure, Ghosts of Songbird Vila, you are exploring a haunted house, but it's not like a dungeon delve in the sense that you would get with, you know, a Tomb of Horrors type thing. Yeah, and that's the other thing. I noticed that, you, that you've that you got four different campaigns in, the, in, um, in this core book. Um did you always have the intention of put of putting in a handful of different um, campaigns when you were laying it out, or was it just the case of you you wrote one, then you still had momentum, so you wrote another and just kept going? No, it was I knew I was going to put in four. I knew I was going to. I wanted half the book. I, I don't know what it actually came out to, but I wanted like half the book to be adventure material because my thinking was I don't want to tell people how to, you know, like I, I could spend a lot of time on setting and stuff like that, but that a lot of that is stuff you can look up in the internet. But what I'd really rather do is illustrate what, the, you know, like what Tales of Song Ling looks like in terms of adventures. And, you know, a lot of times the way that I learned, you know, what, you know, even if I didn't run them, the way that I often learned how, you know, what a systems thing was, was by running the modules or reading the modules. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I just think that they, when they're done well, they can be very illustrative. And so that was the purpose of these ones. And that's why we start with a haunted house adventure. And then we kind of progress to other types of adventures that are, you know, the, the, the first adventure is very familiar territory, I think, for, you know, fantasy RPG type person. But then as you go down the line, you get into much more very tales from the Chinese studio style uh, content. Um and so that was that was the uh, the reasoning, uh, and also I wanted to get a lot of maps in there. You know, I had I was Francesca Burrell did the mapping, and I wanted to I really wanted to uh, have her bring some of these locations to life. So I wanted to make sure that I was making good use of those maps too. I can def I can definitely uh, see I can definitely see the advantages in that. Um, with that with that said. Once again, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to come on to the the um, temple again and enjo and enjoying the particular insanity that gets that gets abound here, even with the technical bullshit. Oh, it was fine. It was mm -hmm. fine. Um, I did want to say to you, by the way, I I answered a question that you asked me about aggregate, and I fell into a rambling <laughs> thing that I sometimes do, and I don't think I answered it correctly. <laughs> No, um, you get no. So I wanted you. You would ask me mm -hmm. about the supernatural elements yeah. in Aggregate, and I had kind of I don't know why I I took that question and went in a direction of saying 
Ogre Gate was a very human centric setting, um, which didn't really make a lot of sense. And I just wanted to revise that answer and say the answer to that question is that um, I, I, I put supernatural in Ogre Gate so that there would be gameable adventure material when you weren't like, like, you know, like you, it's not always easy to run wuxia campaign after wuxia campaign after wuxia campaign as a gm sometimes it's nice to be able to fall back on another type of adventure and so that was the idea well if i can throw a ghost at them that might mix things you know what i mean that was sort of the concept yeah. it turned out it wasn't as hard as i thought to do wuxia adventure after wuxia adventure but that was the original purpose there was to give to mix it up and give people more familiar type adventure material to throw at a party oh, yeah. um but, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I realized after that episode, I was like, I don't think I answered that question very well. So, um, 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 I will. It's a little. It's a little bit flattering that you that you had that question in the back of your mind for that long. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, I, t I I know I ramble, and so sometimes I'll answer people's questions, and I'll be like, I don't think I answered the question accurately to my own <laughs> feeling about the situation. I just was talking, <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I wanted I wanted I wanted another crack at it. <laughs> All right, well, well, consider can consider that crack being um, cracked. <laughs> um, but yeah, any anytime you see fit to re to return to the temple, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. God damn my ping. I mean that happens. <coughs> are we are we not live anymore? Um <laughs> No, it's just it's just on the it's just on the wrap up. Um at, and of course a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the insanity. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>